I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, and and participating in this public information session. Um, my name is Matthew Cropper with Cropper GIS Consulting, um, and I am here to give you an overview of the redistricting project uh, phase two for Brunswick County Schools. Um, we are. Uh, we are, our objectives for this meeting tonight is to give you an overview of the process and the timeline. Uh, we, we have two options that are prepared that we'd like to get, uh, get, get you to know and give you an overview on. And, uh, and really what we'd really like to do is after this, introduce you to a survey and have you give us some feedback and input related to these options. Uh, before I get too far into the presentation, I wanna give you a couple of uh, tips about the Zoom webinar that we're doing here. Um, you'll notice that at the bottom of your little toolbar where you can mute yourself and do things like that, uh, or you can, uh, you'll see a Q&A button down there. And that Q&A button lets you type in questions. We have a, a panel with us of uh, school administrators and also consultants who have been working through the course of the study, and they're able to, to monitor those questions. And when those questions come in, we will answer those questions. It may be at during the presentation, or it may be at the end of the presentation. But feel free to go ahead and ask those questions um, as you as you wish, and um, and we will uh, and address those as the presentation continues. A little bit about who we are. We are Cropper GIS Consulting. We're based out of Ohio, but we have remote offices. Uh, our staff works remotely um, and, and live all over the country. Um, our company's specialty is just this kind of work. We do redistricting studies all over the United States. Um, and, we, and, and so this is our expertise. We also do demographic analysis and population forecasting and also help schools with siting and things like that. Uh, but we are here with the focus on redistricting. Uh, I am Matthew Cropper, and I've been working with the district uh, over the course of the past couple of years. We've worked on uh, a redistricting for phase one that involved mostly impacted the northern part of the county and Town Creek Middle School area. And this is phase two, which is more of, a, of an address on the southern part remainder of the district and looking at that. Although we do have some things we want to share with you um, that could potentially impact some areas in the north. Um, But our primary objectives, like I said, we did some work in phase one, uh, which ended in December 2019, so just not, not too long ago. And those were implemented this year, fall 2020. And Town Creek Middle School has a zone uh, around it now and subsequent redistricting for that. Um, our objectives for this phase are to examine the rest of the district, take a holistic look and see if there are any adjustments that need to be made to address both feeder patterns and or potentially utilization imbalances that exist. And so we're taking a, we, we focused on the North and the phase one for the Town Creek Middle School specifically. And then this phase, we're looking at the rest of the district and just taking a holistic view of the district again, to see if there are any adjustments that should be made. We do have a set of rules to follow and these are basic what we call criteria and they are basically um, guidelines that we use to help us evaluate the options and as as we get closer to a recommendation we will keep asking ourselves does this recommendation bring us closer to adhering to these overall objectives and criteria and these criteria are to the greatest extent possible keep students at a neighborhood school and so try to keep kids as close to their their home as possible um, at where, from versus where they go to school, um, if at all possible. Also to the greatest extent possible, we'll keep maximum student numbers for high schools at 1400, middle schools at 750, and elementary schools at 600. So there are some targets there for numbers of students in buildings, and but we're also looking at utilization because sometimes capacity varies. One school may have more seats, another school may have fewer seats. And so we're not only looking at the numbers of students in building, but we're also looking at utilization, which means percent full, how full is the building, and as it relates to percentage of the students versus seats. Um, and then also keep average bus route between 60 and 75 minutes. And so these are the, these are the criteria that we're focused on as we continue to work through making, uh, making options. And, um, and keep in mind, we are sharing some options with you tonight, but they are draft and they are subject to change and they can be modified as we continue to study the work 
get further input from the public and, uh, and just continue to, to uh, review all the different facets of the study. I'm gonna go through a couple of the phases in our timeline and our process. We basically go through several different phases to accomplish the work to, to, uh, to get this task complete. Um, phase one is to collect data. So we've collected data from a variety of sources um, all over from the county to the school district. We've also utilized it, information that we had from phase one, but we did have to collect new information such as enrollment data and capa updated capacity information and things like that. It's important to note that data collection is kind of an ongoing process and data collection will is always considered to be open and that we are always looking for more input, more information. If the public gives us any insight on something that may not have a stone that may not have been unturned, that's something that we certainly want to hear and, and, and absorb that information and incorporate that into our study. The second phase is putting a lot of the information together and putting it into maps and statistics and tables. So redistricting is a very complicated and complex uh, process and involves, we're looking at elementary, middle and high school. So there's multi-levels, a lot of things moving, different data to look at. So we put this all into a mapping system, our GIS map to help really make things efficient and make accurate and informed decisions as quickly as possible. So we have taken a lot of this data and put it into our mapping, our geographic information system, so that we could study it and analyze uh, different things. One of the things that we've done is uh, uh, what we call planning blocks. And if you look at our interactive map, which I'll point you to here in a minute, um, you'll be able to turn on and off what we call planning blocks. And these are outlines that out, they basically uh, encompass community areas. And with the, the focus is if an area has to move, it moves together. And we, we wanna to try to keep the whole concept of trying to keep a community dynamic. And if we have to move an area, move it together. And we don't wanna draw these planning blocks down the middle of residential streets. We wanna use major roads, backs of property lines, and try to keep, like I said, the communities together. So if an area moves, it moves together. When you look at the map, you'll see that there's a, an identifier of PB, and that's the planning block number, that actually, the ID number for the planning block. So you could potentially uh, tell us what planning block you live in and then uh, by looking at the map and then tell us some input about that. If, if you don't, if you don't uh, feel comfortable with the planning block ID or don't know how to get there fully, you can just tell us maybe the subdivision you live in or the general area you live in and, and that, would, that would help give us some, some further input. Um, and then the bottom number that you'll see on the planning block that you can, you'll be able to toggle on and off different la layers and one of the labels is the, the number of students that live in each planning block. And we have those for elementary, middle, and high school. And um, I'll show you an example here um, of the online map here in, just, in uh, just a minute. I wanna introduce it to you here first. So this is the online map. Now we developed an online map for you for phase one and we used it uh, heavily. And it's, it's at croppermap.com slash BCS. Now, those, these, this map will have options on this, and they should be uh, posted live here by tomorrow at the latest. And so you will see these options on the interactive map. Um, and so when you click on the interactive map, if you go to the web, web page, you'll see that you have, um, it shows you the schools. And then there are a list of layers on the left-hand side. Now, these will show uh, option elementary option A, elementary option B, middle A, middle B, and high school A, high school B, and then high school AB-1. You'll see these here. You can, as you zoom in, you can zoom in by the plus sign. You can use your mouse wheel. Um, I use the plus sign sort of navigate around. And as you get in, you start to see more detail. And so property lines start to show up on the map. More information starts to show up. And what you do as you zoom in on the map, you can toggle on and off different zone lines as well. So turn on the current middle schools, current high schools, and see how the zone lines uh, differ in different areas. And then also toggle on the options. The planning block layer here is a plus sign. And if you click on it, it'll turn on the outlines and the planning block ID number. If you hit the plus sign, you can turn on different labels such as say sixth through eighth grade, and I'll turn off the labels. And this shows you the labels number of students that live in each of these planning blocks. 
And these are the planning blocks. Think of these as the building blocks for redistricting. And we're moving these planning blocks one way or the other to accomplish our objectives. As you look at these, if you think a planning block needs to be modified, if you think it cuts down a residential street, uh, things like that, please give us that input in, in, uh, through, the, through the, uh, the general feedback or the survey that, we, that we're gonna introduce you to. But this will be a very useful tool for you. I use it all the time for when I'm doing planning work as well as when I'm in the district. Um, uh, it's a very useful tool and I hope that you find it to be um, as useful as we do. The third phase after developing tools and things like that. So the online map is a tool. We've developed uh, different, different methods and different uh, utilities to help in inform you and, and tell the story. And the third phase is we create some options. And so we've created a series of options that we brought uh, to an internal group uh, that uh, consists of school administrators um, and within the district. And we gave them some options to start with just to give some, get some input from them and get their gut reactions. Uh, we've shared these and in the, in the, this group has evaluated and given us feedback and we have modified options and made adjustments to bring us to where we are tonight, which are to bring you two maps to share with you pr uh, primarily. And the fourth phase and one of the most important phases is the committee and public engagement. And so it's really important to get input from all the stakeholders. And so we're getting input as consultants, we are helping to facilitate this process and give uh, a lot of expertise in what has and hasn't worked in communities across the country. Um, but uh, you guys are here to help us. And so we're working with an internal planning team who is giving us information about the options and then also um, we're engaging the public to get some input from you uh, throughout the course of this study. Another thing to note is, uh, is Daniel Siemens is posting some things in the chat window that can be helpful information for members of the public. If you go there, you can also see some links and helpful, helpful links that he's posting up there as well. So we're really taking a lot of in your input and, and we want to hear what you have to say and get your feedback. And we will make changes to maps if your input does bring us closer to adhering to our objectives and criteria. Uh, we have to think about a plan that's best for all children, but we are focused on, on making adjustments and we, we are listening to what is uh, being told, told to us and uh, feedback that's being provided to us. Um, the school board is expected to take action on a plan in March of 2021. And the plan is expected to take place in, for the for most part of fall of 2021. So next fall is when most of these changes, uh, whatever the recommendation may be, is that's when it's ex expected to take place. So this is our timeline. You can see uh, that we have the data collection and data assimilation component that I've talked about. And then the internal options development with administration, we've been working with the group in the district since October and developing scenarios back and forth. We're meeting with this, this team every other week to look at maps and statistics and, and prepare for, for upcoming meetings. Here we are on December 1st, sharing some options with you and introducing the options to you. Uh, there will also be some additional uh, opportunity for you to provide input. You'll see the pink rose uh, show you extended public comments at the Board of Education meetings, where the board is inviting you to come out and you can provide some extended public comment at those meetings. By that time, you'll have, you would have seen these maps and provide input and you can go to the board in January to, to provide some more input. We are coming back to the public in February after we continue to study the maps and look at input and just continue to achieve our objectives and criteria. And we will be coming back in, in February with uh, another public information session for you. It's possible at that time, we may have, we may have narrowed down to one map where we are leaning towards uh, honing in on one map and looking at making adjustments off of one map. It's very possible at that point. And then there's another extended public comment period provided in, in March on March 2nd for you. So you could see that there are many opportunities for the public to give us input in between the, the, the green and the pink. There's always uh, methods, the general feedback forms and things like that that are online that you can give us input, talk to us and tell us what you think about the maps. So like I said, since the last meeting with the last public information session, we have two draft options to share with you. 
and um, and they had just been these. This is an evolution of maps that have been that have been explored and evaluated through the course uh, to where we are today. It's important to note that they are draft. These maps could change, and they are subject to change based off of uh, uh, continual review. And so they they can and and it's very possible that they may be modified. We're estimating enrollment looking at the 1920 and the 2020 21 student enrollment data. There has been a lot of impacts on enrollment across the country as a result of COVID. And uh, enrollment came in this year in, in Brunswick County, just like it did in many other counties across the country, if not all of them. It came in lower than, than what we may have expected because of parental choice and uh, students not returning to schools. And so we are analyzing both 1920 and 2020-21 data so that we can really understand, looking at it from 1920 and a 2021 perspective, looking at what could the potential enrollment be um, from two different data points so that we don't overestimate or underestimate uh, utilization when we start looking at these at estimated utilizations for schools. We are assuming that if you live in a zone, you go to that school. Um, most of the kids that live and attend in Brunswick County schools do go to the school that they're zoned for. There are elements of students attending from out of zone, and but it's not to a degree that's going to offset our estimates and, and, and cause any detriment to what we're estimating. So let's look at some options here. These are just some side-by-side -side comparisons of the elementary options A and B. And I have some more detailed maps and things after this that I can share with you. But I wanted to kind of just give you a holistic uh, overview of the maps from, from a district level. So when you look at these maps, you'll see the background color represents the option. So on the left is option A, on the right is option B. Um, the, the bold black outline represents the current boundary. So this is the Waccamaw zone that comes here and, and stretches around. And this is the Jesse May Monroe zone that comes up here currently. In option A, you'll notice an option A and an option B, the Jesse May Monroe zone sends some area to Waccamaw. And this is, this is an area that is sent to Waccamaw in both options to help preserve the feeder pattern alignment. Currently, uh, Waccamaw serves as a K-8 school. And there are students that um, in that Jesse May Monroe area that go to school for K-5, and then they go to Waccamaw for six through eight. So it's sort of a break in continuity for some students in that area. What this is doing is this is sending that area from Jesse May Monroe that went to elementary school. It's sending that entire community to Waccamaw for K through eight. So that those kids, when they go, when they get done with elementary in this area in the, uh, in the Jesse May Monroe zone, they, they, they'll go to Waccamaw and then they'll continue to Waccamaw with all their peers. And that helps preserve a fe aligned feeder patterns and avoids a very small split of Jesse May Monroe students going to a different middle school uh, where the rest of their sixth through eighth grade peers uh, would go to Shalote Middle School. And so that's, um, that's the, uh, the, the main driver behind that. So you'll see this is a common move in both options the Jesse May Monroe sends an area to Waccamaw to fix the, to align feeder patterns for that area. Another area that I'll have you focus on is down in the southwestern section of Union Elementary. You'll notice in option B, this area moves to Jesse May Monroe out of Union Elementary, only in option B. This is done to help give some utilization relief to Union. Union Elementary is running close to capacity. It's running a little high up getting into the 90% utilization range. And it's starting to feel some pressures of that. And, uh, and so this option B is a look to give Union a little bit of that pressure relief, balance it out by sending it to Jesse May Monroe and option B and, uh, and get really balancing utilization of these two schools. And we did that in option option B, left it in option A so that we could still continue to evaluate both of them. And so that's a difference between A and B, this union area of union going to Jesse Monroe and B, but not in option A. The third area that you'll see uh, elementary adjustments being considered in these options is between Virginia Williamson and Southport Elementary. You see this is Middleton, uh, this is Middleton Road that stretches up here. And this is the St. James community. Uh, it's a large, uh, there are multiple phases of this with St. James community. 
Currently, this area, uh, the Virginia Williamson zone, stretches over to pick up the St. James community and they go to Virginia Williamson Elementary School. What this map does in option A is moves all of the area, uh, all of Middleton and East to Southport Elementary School. And this is done to align a feeder pattern from one look to align feeder patterns. So what this does is this area right here currently gets split between, um, between uh, Oak Grove Middle and South Brunswick Middle School. And, and so this would actually, this alignment, moving this to Southport would align to keep all the South, Southport students in here. You, they would go to Southport and then they would go to South Brunswick Middle School. Um, and I'll show you that here at uh, Cedar Grove, I'm sorry, Cedar Grove Middle School is, uh, is the, the area that's in Virginia Williamson. So this map, just focusing on elementary, moves area east of Middleton to Southport Elementary out of Virginia Williamson in the elementary A. In elementary B, you'll see that this area does not move out of Williamson. It stays in Williamson Elementary and does not move to Southport. Those are the only elementary adjustments that we are considering right now for options A and B. There's nothing as it, on the table right now for Supply or Bolivia, Town Creek, or anything in the north. We're really just looking at the schools that I, that I showed you and gave you an overview on. Middle schools, um, we're looking at some similar adjustments in similar areas. So there is an adjustment here, another feeder pattern adjustment here that you see between Waccamaw and Shalote Middle, where we are sending an area that currently goes to Shalote to Waccamaw. This is just like that Jesse May Monroe Waccamaw example I was giving you. This is an area where a small percentage of kids go to Waccamaw for K-5, but then they go to Shalote for six through eight. This aligns that feeder pattern so that all of Waccamaw zone is a K-8 zone and every student inside there goes to Waccamaw from K through eight and there is no small split of students going to a different school. You'll see that that exists in both option A and option B. The other adjustment that I was talking about, I was referring to earlier was the adjustment uh, between South Brunswick and Cedar Grove. In option A, remember we moved Virginia Williamson into Southport, uh, the, the St. James area. We didn't make any adjustments to middle schools in option A in this area, but what that does is the elementary adjustment provides 100% feeder of, um, of Southport into South Brunswick and Virginia Williamson into Cedar Grove. Not a, very, not a small split of Virginia Williamson going to South Brunswick Middle. In option B, we didn't move Virginia Williamson into Southport, but instead we're looking at instead of leaving Virginia Williamson as it is, but move the South, the Cedar Grove Middle School line to pick up St. James. And so this, this is a different look that impacts the St. James community um, at the middle school level, but not at the elementary level. So, um, so this area is moved to Cedar Grove in option B and not in option A. And that's it for middle schools that were that as, as uh, the extent of what we are evaluating for middle schools as it sits right now in options A and B. High schools are um, a little, uh, we're taking a couple of looks about high school and I wanna talk about high school a little bit. So we have looked at A options for both those A and B options. There's one thing that we know that we need to do and that's to move a little section here that was moved in phase one from, um, from North Brunswick into South Brunswick High School. It was a little section on the Southern end that was moved into um, South Brunswick Middle. And we're moving it into South Brunswick to make sure that we clean up a very small feeder pattern. If that was something that we had, had communicated that we were pretty sure we were going to do. But there's another thing that's happening with high schools that we, are, that we wanted to be mindful of. But we don't think that we necessarily need to make a move, this move yet. And this is what we're calling high school option A, B-1. And the challenge here is that high schools are fairly, uh, utilization is fairly balanced at your high schools with the exception of North Brunswick High School. And if we look at the forecasts, what we're forecasting for enrollment, what we're seeing in your middle schools coming through, we do expect North Brunswick High School to continue to grow. Um, Currently, it's not that bad. It's sitting right around 1,200 students.
But when it starts to get up to 1400, uh, over 1400, it starts to become overcrowded. And then, uh, so we're expecting North Brunswick High School to grow and South Brunswick is expected to, to steadily decline enrollment. So what we're thinking of is doing a contingency plan that basically uh, assigns some, pulls some area out of North Brunswick High School into South Brunswick High School. And we're thinking that this would be done if and when North Brunswick High School's enrollment reaches 1400. So it's, it's the, the, this change, this AB1 change would be triggered when the North Brunswick High School enrollment reaches 1400. We expect that to occur sometime around 2023, 2024. Is that's what the forecast suggests, but you will continue to evaluate and monitor. I know that COVID certainly has an impact on enrollment and we're continuing to study how that's gonna impact in the long term, but we still do anticipate this being a need in the short term uh, out a couple of years, but we don't think it's necessary right now. So what we're suggesting and what we're evaluating right now, not necessarily suggesting is make the adjustment for high school for feeder patterns, for either option, but consider this adjustment uh, if and when North Brunswick High School reaches 1,400 students, and that's and that's um, and that's sort of a contingency plan that um, that we're building in this process so that we can be prepared if and when the school North Brunswick High School needs capacity relief. And this is the Mallory Creek de uh, development. Most of this area uh, that that is being picked up here is an area that's uh, currently in uh, Belleville and it's going to Leland and um, the North Brunswick High School. It's mostly the Mallory Creek community in there that, that I am referring to that would that has the majority of students, about a hundred students in here that we're looking at that we can give some capacity relief to North Brunswick High School if we get to that, uh, that, that enrollment threshold that we've identified. So I have um, a variety of statistics and maps and things like that that we have prepared for you that we that we want to share with you. And um, and so uh, this is uh, this, this presentation will be shared with you in the um, in the. Uh, Next day or so, we will we will share a link to this recording of this presentation, as well as a, a link to this story map. And when you look at this, you can toggle on and off the different areas. So I'd like to, to take a look so you can see the current zones are shown, but then you could toggle on the uh, option A. Let's see here. Oh, I know. There's an explore button. You have to explore to, to be able to evaluate and look into this. And you can look at option A and it'll turn on option A. And then option B, I'll turn on as well. And what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of a, a zoom in on some of these areas. Um, so this is option A that we were talking about for Jesse May Monroe. And you could see some of the areas that we are extending our, our zone lines. Uh, there are some communities along the rural um, Ash, um, Ash Little River Road is where the communities mostly live along here. Um, if you look at option B, I'll zoom in to the same area. We have the same areas move, but I'm going to zoom into this area on the bottom left part of Union to give you a little more detail there and see what we're looking at here. So you can see that we're off, off of Beach Drive here um, in Causeway. This area right here is this an area south of, one, uh, of 179 Beach Drive is going into uh, Jesse May Monroe in this option. And then, as I mentioned, the area that was moved to Virginia Williamson only exists in option A. And I'll pan over so you can kind of see that here. And like I said, it's everything east and on both sides of Middleton Boulevard. And it also extends up into this area. There are a few kids in here to, to that aligns along that major road that would feed into Southport in option A. And at middle school, I'll point you to this one area. This is the small split that we resolved that, uh, that we have pulled out of, uh, that sent to Waccamaw out of Shalot in this map. And then in option B,
turn on middle school. We did that same area out of out of uh, Shalot Middle, but we this option is where we're looking at the um, area east of Middleton going into Cedar Grove out of South Brunswick Middle School for option. Um, and then the high school, as, as I said, high school is really um, both the same for A and B, but we are pulling this area out of North Brunswick into South Brunswick, really just a couple of streets here off of River Road that are going into uh, South Brunswick uh, High School. And then looking at the AB option, this is one, and you'll see here, we have it written here, it's a contingency when North Brunswick reaches 1400 students. This is what we are considering. And this is, um, the extent of the communities that we're looking at considering to go from Mallory from uh, North Brunswick to South Brunswick High School. There are subsequent statistics and data that accompany all of this information. So when you look at the maps and data, you can see the 1920 and the 2021 enrollment and utilization. Um, what was it? Uh, what 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 is it if for option A? We're looking at it from both both 1920 and 2021 because you can see there's about 300 fewer students in elementary grades alone uh, between the two years. So we're looking at both years to make sure that seeing maybe a high point uh, and and making sure that we don't over underestimate. We have race and ethnic data. We have the number of students impacted. So you'll see in option A, um, 70 students are impacted at elementary school and we have feeder pattern data um, in here to give you an overview. Middle school option A, turn on the st stats here, only seven students. So we're really looking at minor adjustments uh, that you could see as you see here. And looking at option B, focusing on elementary because that is probably where most of the impacts are. You can see 93 students are impacted at elementary for middle school option B. So from 70 to 93 students is what we're looking at at the elementary level for, for impacts. And then for middle school, again, 19 students. So a very small number of students impacted um, in our options. Um, and then the high school option, a uh, high school option, let's just take a quick look at those statistics here. Let's see. 20 students impact in that small area. And like I said, if AB is considered, and AB is something that, that the board wants to consider, we're looking at about 114 students in that area that would be that would be impact, about 100 students in there that would be moved out of North Brunswick to South Brunswick High School for the AB contingency option. So, like I said, we have a survey that has been developed for this process, and I'm going to show you that here in just a second. You can access all this information on Brunswick County Public Schools webpage, where they have a redistricting site, a page that's dedicated just for this effort. And you can go on there and see and get to the links for all this information. We have a survey that we're kicking off tonight. The deadline for the survey is December 13th to 2020. So, um, so you can take your time and tell your neighbors and friends and family that they can go on here and fill out the survey, look at the information, maybe give it some time, see the YouTube clip that we'll be posting on in a day or two if you want to recap and look at some of this, uh, a recap of this presentation that will be recorded. And then also there will be other opportunities for, for input, for you to provide input. So this is not the final opportunity. We're not showing you final maps. Uh, this is really, a, a, we're in a draft phase here and in introducing these to you. So we, we have a survey and the survey is located on the district's webpage. So if you go to the Brunswick County Schools page, you'll see a redistricting, a phase two uh, option. You can get there and you'll see a survey here. Click here to complete the survey on draft options A and B. And then when you click on that, you'll see that there are a lot of useful links here. We have the statistics page. There's a handout 
that you can download that has all of the statistics and data that you can look at. The online map link is here, as well as uh, when you get in here and you look at for option A, we have maps here that you can click on and it'll show you a large map of the, of the, um, of the options. So you can kind of see which map was that. And they're, they're pretty high resolution. So just give them a second, but they'll show up. So you can kind of look at the map and use that as a guide as well. Give us your input. We want to hear your opinions on all of the material that we put together. And we're, uh, we're looking to get this from you. We're going to close this down on December 13th so that we can take your input and, and put it and materialize it into a report and study your input that, that you've been providing. But in addition to that, in addition to that, there is a uh, general feedback form that's on the redistricting page that at any time you can go and you'll see a general feedback form in the timeline and then it links to the interactive map. So I encourage you to go to the district page to really get access to these resources. There's a really a lot, all, everything is on here. And if you don't, can't find something, you can even ask a question in the general feedback form. As we look at the questions, we'll respond to you. We'll reach out to you and make sure that you're clear. And finally, when you when this when this this uh, link to this uh, presentation is available online, there will be embedded links in here. So when you get to the end of this, you can you can interact the, just like I have been on this page with the maps and tabbing around, and looking at the maps. Um, these also have embedded links to the survey, as well as the main page online map, and then finally the option statistics handout is at the back, and. Um, and so that's, that is all we have the, uh, prepared for tonight. Um, I'm looking to see, I don't see any questions that have been posed. Um, if you do have any questions, if you could give you some time, you can ant put those into the Q and A in the, into the Zoom. Um, and uh, we will just continue to um, continue to look out for feedback from you and uh, and I really appreciate your time and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. That went great, thank you. Thank you.